Well, I bet you can't figure out which book we're going into today, huh? Hmm, wonder which one it could be. Titus, you're right. Pretty close. You're in the right testament. Uh, so last week, uh, though, Pastor Stephen, he preached to us about the importance of unity in the church. And if you'll remember, there were four things in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, that Paul specifically asked the Philippians to do in order to make his joy complete. Uh, let's see what we remember. He asked them to be of the same mind, mind good, maintaining the same love. love. Love, that's right, good, okay. United in spirit, spirit. okay, good. And intent on one, begins with P, think Rick Warren. Purpose. Purpose, okay, we got it. There we go, that did it. <laughs> right, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, and intent on one purpose. And that was a picture of Christian unity being played out. What I'd like you to do today is I'd like you to reflect a little bit on those four ideas as we come to this particular text today, because today we're going to be talking about a type of person or a type of group of people, and they are known for bringing disharmony and disunity into the church. Now, before I get started, I just want everybody to know, before I start, the problems that are being mentioned in the book of Jude, I don't see these in our congregation right now. Maybe somebody does. Uh, at least, currently speaking, I don't think that, the, that this is a problem. I, I think they, there may have, we may have had some past problems in our history um, here at Cross Country, but I don't see it as a problem right now. So if you think, oh, oh my goodness, Pastor Jonathan must be calling me out. Oh, no, nope, I, I'm not doing it. Uh, it's, no, I honestly don't see it. But, but the reason that I wanted to bring this forward today is because our church is at a point where we really want to start growing. And as we start growing... The enemy's not going to like that. We're going to really start facing some spiritual opposition, including various attempts to disrupt our unity. So I look at the book of Jude as a possible warning for us for the future, maybe even for the near future, because there is a certain group of people that are known for uh, especially being very disruptive to the unity of the church when you have a small church, but it's just starting to grow, and they want to take advantage of that and get into a power position. So that's why I'm bringing this to our attention. Now, I see this as a potential future danger for cross-country church. And um, let's face it, if there is a danger in the Bible that is so important, an entire book is devoted to that danger— then we should probably pay attention to it. Not to be paranoid of it, but at least to be wise about it. At least to be spiritually prepared so that if something does come up in our future, we're equipped to handle it rather than unequipped. So let's turn now to the book of Jude so that we get the text under our belts and then we can figure out how to apply the text. Uh, Jude is the book right before Revelation, so just turn to the very back of your Bible and then back a book and you've got it. We're going to go through the entire book today. For those of you that are freaking out, it's just one chapter, so we're, it's good, it's short. But uh, let's get into the Word of God here, the book of Jude. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons 
who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. For pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage." But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were saying to you, In the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Sometimes it's good to read an epistle in its entirety to remember that they are letters, and even in the early church, even the big ones were often read from start to finish. Uh, reason for that being that was their that was their original intent. They were letters. They were meant to be read all the way through. In Jude's case, though, um, Jude calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Uh, and just to let you know, that means actually he was also half-brother to Jesus, as James was. The same James, in this case, being the James who wrote the epistle of James. Um, so this is Jude. We don't know who exactly he wrote to. We don't know which church he was writing to or which collection of churches. It's one of those mysteries. Um, but nevertheless, he's definitely writing to a specific church or a specific group of churches. It seems like one church that is having a very specific problem. And the problem that they are having is with false Christians. Now, in order to get to who it is we're talking about here, when I say false Christians, there are things that I think we need to take note of. There are certain groups of people we are not including in this list that can cause issues and cause problems for us, but that's not who we're talking about. Number one, we're not talking about unbelievers coming in and visiting the church. Unbelievers that are coming in and visiting the church are very welcome to be here. Could they cause us issues? Sure, they could. They're going to disagree with what we're preaching. 
Maybe they're not going to like something said from the pulpit. Maybe there will be a social slight or something. They take it that way. It's, they, uh, we're not brothers, or at least not yet. Maybe we will be in the future. But unbelievers could cause us issues. But they are welcome among us. We want people to come, to visit, to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about them. We're also not talking about new believers and baby Christians. New believers can cause problems in a congregation. These are problems that when they arise, we should take a deep breath, maybe sigh a little, look to the heavens, and then be thankful we have those problems. Be thankful that we have new Christians among us who need the coaching. They need the discipleship so that they can grow. We often refer to new Christians as baby Christians. And as we are no doubt aware, babies have a tendency to make messes. They can't take care of themselves. And they poop their diapers. They need help. They need somebody to come along and give them assistance. We're not talking about them. We would be very happy to have more of those problems, even if it doesn't always feel like that in the moment. But those are problems to be thankful for because then we're helping people grow. No, we're talking about false Christians. These are people who fake it. They fake being Christian. Maybe these are people that they have been involved in church all their lives. They might even believe that they are Christian. But they have not repented, they have not turned to faith in Christ. They're kind of under that, uh, under that delusion of, well, just because I'm hanging out in a garage, that must make me a car. These are people who try to selfishly use the church for their own advantage. There's a payoff for them for being in church. Maybe it's because their ego is getting stroked. Maybe there's some sort of social standing that they are seeking. Maybe it's because there's a financial incentive for them to be in the church. Um, maybe it's because there are community relationships in the church, and that's what they're feeding off of. Maybe the community relationships are tied to their finances. Maybe it's because they have a position of power in the church and they want to keep that power, but they're not actually believers. Oftentimes, those false Christians who gain positions of authority in a church, especially as they are causing damage, we have another word that we tend to call them. Unlike baby Christians, who are still sheep, they're lambs, we call these people wolves. And usually wolves need to be dealt with in a very firm manner. The result often in churches is that when wolves come into a church, they can often destroy or at least greatly harm a church. I think we probably all have stories at this point of churches that were severely, severely harmed because a wolf or wolves got in among the congregation, settled in, and then started exploiting that church for their own power, their own gain, their own advantage. These are the people whom we need to be wary of. They're not the only group of people, but they are certainly one group we want to be very wary of. And it's very common, very common for churches that are just starting to grow again, and there's excitement, and things are happening for somebody on the outside to be attracted to that. Maybe they come from another church. Maybe they come from down stateside and they've just moved here, but they realize there's an opportunity for me to get on the ground floor and maybe establish a power base or, or some other motivation. It's common. And so we need, to be very, we need to be vigilant, we need to be diligent just to make sure that that 
doesn't happen or when it does happen that we address it. So we're going to learn two things from Jude today. Number one, we're going to learn how to identify false Christians. And uh, number two, we're going to learn what it is we need to do. But interestingly enough, when Jude talks about what we need to do, he talks about what we need to do for ourselves and what we need to do for others. He does not directly address what to do about the false Christians. There are other scriptures, but we're not going to go to those other scriptures today. Because what I want to do is I want to focus in on Jude's message. So today we're going to learn what we can do for ourselves and what we can do for others when we have false Christians, when we have wolves come into our, and come into our sheepfold and what, need, what needs to be done at least there. So, how do false Christians often enter the church? If you have your bulletin with you, there is an insert. How do false Christians often enter the church? They creep in unnoticed. Jude, uh, the first verse, uh, excuse me, the first part of Jude verse 4 says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. In the 10th chapter of John, verse 1, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs, by, climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Alarms don't usually sound when a false Christian comes into our midst or when a wolf comes in. Because usually, not always, but oftentimes, a false Christian they know the culture, they know the lingo, they know how to talk and how to act and how to sound like a Christian. We might have a little feeling that like something seems to be a little off. Maybe it's a prompting by the Holy Spirit. But very often when false Christians come in, we just don't notice right away. They can even quote Bible verses. Sometimes wolves have held leadership positions in other churches, and they may even carry a certain air of spiritual authority. And so when they come in, and often also being uh, personality-wise charismatic individuals, they may even attract people to them. However, when you get right down to who they are and what they do, they are very very dangerous. There are three primary characteristics that I want us to remember about false Christians, what they're like. So let's take a look at the first one. First, they defile. They defile. In this particular case, it's kind of interesting when we contrast two particular churches and look at them. Let's take a look at Galatia and Corinth. The problem with Galatia and with some of the people coming into Galatia was that in their case, the, uh, the people that were coming into the church and causing problems there were saying, you need to obey the law more, you need to obey the law more. And uh, Christian liberty was getting really stifled. It was being contracted to the point, no, you need to obey this law, you need to obey this law, you need to be circumcised, you need to do this, you need to do that. Obey the law, obey the law, obey the law. And Paul had to speak into that and spoke very, very strongly into that. What's happening in Jude, though, is more along the lines of what was also happening in the church of Corinth. In Corinth, rather than Christian liberty being contracted down smaller than it should be, the Corinthians were blowing up uh, Christian liberty to be much bigger than it should be. And their liberty was leading to licentiousness. The behavior of the Corinthian church was, well, if you've ever visited Vegas and Reno, you've got a pretty good idea. That was, that was the city of Corinth. That was the culture, and that had gone into the church. Uh, in this case, uh, many false Christians, in one way or another, they really value the world. They, view, they value sensuality, and I mean that I mean that in the case of anything having to do with any of the senses. They may value things like money. They may value things like food. They may value certain intimate relationships that they shouldn't be having. Verse 4 
talks about ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. Oh, we've got, we've got freedom in Christ? Great, then I'm going to do whatever I want to do and whatever feels good. That's not Christian liberty. Verse 7 talks about how in Sodom and Gomorrah and with some of the angels, they indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. And then continues on in verse 8 to say, yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh. So they're even using dreams as a way to sustain what it is they're doing. Well, I, I had a vision that this should take place. You know, I can think of a certain man who called himself a prophet and used dreams and visions in order to uh, basically persuade young women that they should marry him, in plural. <laughs> so, um, dreams are often, they can be used, or other spiritual experiences can be used in order to justify going down immoral roads. Um, also, in verse 13, the false Christians are described as wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. There's no shame with many of them. What they do, they just, they parade it out in front of everybody. I won't name his name right now, but I can think of a certain man who claimed to be a Christian leader, and uh, one of the things that he ended up doing was he had, in quotes, an emotional affair with his, uh, one of the secretaries, one of the office workers. This is not somebody locally, this is somebody nationally. And in the process, he ended up getting a divorce from his wife, ended up marrying this other woman, and he is still continuing with his ministry today. It's a, di more diminished now than it was, but for a while... He was huge, millions of followers all over the place. But there was very little done in the way of repentance or turning around or uh, doing anything in order to truly make things right. Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. Verse 10 talks about the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals, that animal instinct, by these things they are destroyed. That often happens. I think we've seen that a lot with certain Christian leaders today that, uh, now, some of them may not have been wolves themselves, but men who just, or men and women who just fell into particular temptations, but when you see a pattern of behavior from certain people and they get caught it's often because of those sensual things that they were enjoying, those things come back to, in the end, destroy them. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 has the corrective measure, though, for this idea that licentiousness is an extension of Christian liberty. Because Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? That's the miracle of Jesus. It is true. The more you sin, yes, the more Jesus' blood covers you. That's right. If you sin more, you're going to receive more grace to that extent. So are you supposed to sin so you can get more grace? The answer, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? It's death to live in sin. Why do we want to wallow around in it anymore? It doesn't make sense. But it does to those false Christians who want to have their cake and eat it too. Okay, so the first characteristic is that they defile. The second is they reject and revile. I thought about splitting these two, and I probably could have, but I wanted to put them together because both of those words actually have to deal with authority. In verse 4, it talks about how false Christians deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I had to think for a minute. I was like, well, how could that be? I mean, often they are in the church, often singing the hymns and quoting Bible verses. How is it that they're denying? And then I thought, oh, well, usually it's through their deeds. What they do, their works, when you examine their fruit, you realize that they are not living with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Master. Their God is their appetite. That's who it is that they are truly living their life for. They're living often for themselves. They reject the authority of Jesus Christ. I think that's one reason why when Jude ends his epistle, he ends it in this way. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Hammering home that point that God is absolute Master, The Lord is master. He is king of the universe, and we need to be following him. False Christians don't do that. They may pay lip service, but when you examine their lives, you realize that's not what they're doing at all. They'll also revile angelic majesties. Another word that we could put in here that other translations use is slander. Can you think of how many false prophets there have been out there that said, well, I had the word from an angel. Something came down from an angel. An angel told me to do this. An angel told me to do that. Well, wait a minute. What the angel said wasn't biblical. It doesn't matter. It came from an angel. Which angel did you get it from? Oh, I got it from uh, Gabriel. Really? Oh, Gabriel's name just got slandered there. They slander, they revile angelic majesties. Now, what's interesting here is that there is a story in here about Michael and Satan. And this story actually comes from another book called The Assumption of Moses, which is not found in the Bible. You won't find this story in the Bible, but Jude quotes it. So, uh, I'm guessing the story really did happen. I'm not going to say The Assumption of Moses is a canonical book or that it's scripture. It is not. But apparently this story happened where Michael and Satan had a dispute over Moses' body. Now we could go into depth about what all that meant, but then we would lose the important part of the point. We'd lose the important point that Jude was trying to make. Here was the point of the story. Michael and Satan are having a fight over uh, Moses' body. Now think about who we're talking about. Satan, the most despicable of all the angels. Michael, the greatest of all the angels, the greatest of the archangels. If anybody ever in the history of the universe had a right to slander an angel, to say nasty things about an angel, Michael would have had that right right there. Oh, that's Satan. Let me just say all kinds of things about him at this point. Let me slander Satan. Michael, certainly, if anybody would have had that right, Michael would have had the right to do that. He didn't. All he did was rebuke Satan. That was it. The point Jude's trying to make is, if Michael doesn't feel like he has the right to slander an angel that's as corrupt and terrible as Satan, what makes these people feel like they have a right to talk about angels the way they do? They have absolutely no right whatsoever. That is why Jude brought this story out, to say, look, if Michael's not doing it, They shouldn't be either, but they are, and they do. Think about how many books are out there today written by, at the very least, highly questionable people, and at the very most, downright heretical people that are about angels. Angels helping with this, angels helping with that. I'm sure if we looked into it, there's an angel weight loss book out there. Lose those at 15 pounds by the power of angels. I wouldn't be surprised reviling the angelic majesties. This is a very serious thing to do. So these people, these false Christians, these wolves, they defile, they reject and revile, and they are deceptively unproductive. Let's just take a look at some of these 
illustrations that Jude uses. He uses very colorful language to describe them. Clouds without water. In an agricultural society in the arid Middle East, you look for those clouds. You, you want the rain. This isn't like, you know, Alaska where often we look out and sometimes we want the rain, but most of the, sun, most of the time we're staring out there. We're like, could we have some sun, please? We're tired of the rain. We could use some sun here. That's not the way things work in the Middle East. They want the rain to come. Why? Rain means crops. Crops mean, hey, yes, we get to eat. Rain is a, rain is a blessing. False Christians are like clouds coming along, and you're like, yes, 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 we're going to get something good. There's going to be a blessing here, and nothing. Thanks a lot. Looks like it's going to be a drought. If there's a drought, there's a famine. Famines are bad. Clouds without water, carried along by the winds, just going along this way and that, never stopping and actually doing what they're supposed to do. Putting a little water on the land, please. No? Okay. Their autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted. They've got no fruit. They might even look kind of good. And Wow, that's an impressive looking tree over there. Great, let's go get some fruit from... Ah, I can't find anything. Let's face it, the last time Jesus encountered a tree that didn't have fruit with it, it didn't go so well for the tree. They're also like wandering stars. Now that might sound a little interesting if, uh, for, for those of you that are uh, into astronomy. You, you probably remember that a wandering star is a planet. And the difference between wandering stars in the night sky as opposed to true stars is that the true stars were seen, being seen as rather fixed in Space, okay, there, there's that constellation, there's that constellation, there's that constellation. But then you have Venus and Jupiter. Woo, they're going around all over the place, wandering this way and that. They're, they're very fun to see in the night sky. But especially if you're watching them over a period of time, you'll realize they don't have that appearance of having a fixed spot as, uh, as the constellations, as the stars do. False teachers are like that. They're wandering around all over the place. You can't really pin them down. And, of course, as Jude points out, the darkest blackness is reserved for them. So false Christians, they defile, they reject and revile, and they are deceptively unproductive. You think they're going to be a blessing, and they're not. Their ultimate fate, though, if they are a true, <laughs> a true false Christian, there's an oxymoron for you. If, if, they are a, if they are a false Christian, their ultimate fate is condemnation. Jude does not mince words about this. Verse 4, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. And then verses 14 and 15 say, It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in, a, in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So these are people that are marked out for condemnation. They're marked out for judgment. They're marked out to be convicted. And it's because of what they do and because of what they say. Now, is it possible that some false Christians might be saved? Well, if they've been marked long beforehand for condemnation, then the answer is no, they're, they're done. If that is indeed the, the pathway that they have gone down, they're done. But there is a difference between those who are false Christians, and that is the way that they are going to go, and those that might look exactly like false Christians, and yet they're actually, I guess what we might call um, 
pre-Christians? Maybe they've been in church their whole life. Maybe they're acting like wolves. They're doing all these things. But in the end, there's going the Holy Spirit's going to get hold of them, is going to convict them. They're going to turn around and they're going to repent. The problem is we're not going to be able to always tell the difference. It's awfully hard to tell those wheat, the wheat from the tares, isn't it? We don't know who the false Christian that is destined for eternity in hell is and who the pre-Christian is who's doing a lot of things that looks like what the false Christian is doing, and yet they're actually going to come to know Christ. Eventually we will be able to tell which, which they are through repentance. If they turn their lives around, if they repent well, then they truly were meant to be among us. If they never repent, they're false Christians. We have a job to do when we encounter somebody that does seem to be a false Christian. One thing we need to make sure that we do is proclaim the gospel message because the gospel is going to bring one of two things to everybody who encounters it. Either one, it's going to bring salvation to those who hear it, to those who proclaim their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repent. They will be saved. But proclaiming the gospel also brings condemnation to those who hear it and reject it. It is not our burden, it's not our burden to determine who's going to be saved and who's going to be condemned. It is our burden, though, to get the message out. Now, what do we need to do? What do we do? Well, I, I think that the key verse in the book of Jude may very well be verse 3, where Jude says, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. We need to contend earnestly for the faith. We're going to need to fight, and we're going to need to fight hard for what it is that we believe. We're going to need to fight hard for this church. This church is worth fighting for, isn't it? And by church, I mean the people who are here. We are worth fighting for. We are a band of brothers and sisters. And if there is a wolf that comes in among our camp, then we need to be prepared to fight in the way in which the Lord has set out. So, and just to repeat, Jude gives us some instructions for how we're going to deal with the situation for ourselves and how we're going to help others in our church deal with false Christians, he does not give instructions himself on how to deal directly with the false Christians. Those do come through other scriptures. But that's what I want to look at now is how, what do we do for ourselves and what do we do for those who are around us? Well, there are four things that we can do for ourselves. And all four of these things are located back in verses 20 and 21. First, build yourself up on the faith. Build yourself up on the faith. I've got four ideas on this one. When you're building yourself up on the faith, first and foremost, you need to do so biblically. The foundation of the church, the cornerstone of the church is Christ. But the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets. We do not have apostles and prophets walking around right now on the earth. Eventually, well, we'll get to the book of Revelation in another day. But we do have the writings and the words of the apostles and prophets right here. If we want to build ourselves up, this is how we do it, both individually and also corporately as a church. We build ourselves up biblically. Second, after getting that foundation, or as we're getting that foundation built, we need to build ourselves doctrinally. 
we need to make sure that our theology is in line. The Bible provides the framework by which we determine what it is that we believe and we, we figure that out. The Bible tells us and then we can put it into a system, what's called systematic theology. Um, one way that you can go, though, if you're wondering, well, where, where do I begin? I don't usually do systematic theology. It sounds kind of icky. Do I have to? Um, one place that I think is really handy where you can begin is if you go on to the Southern Baptist Convention website, there's a particular document called the Baptist Faith and Message. And it's just a good place to start. There are certain statements, general statements of belief. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about the church? What do we believe about stewardship? What do we believe about salvation? And there are key texts under each statement. So it's a great way to go in. It's a, it's a great resource, actually, for memory verses. Good place to go. A third place where we can build ourselves up is service. If you haven't found a place, and boy, this is hard to say in here because everybody I look at in here, I've seen them doing service in one way or another. But if you're ever stuck in your walk with Christ, one way in which to become unstuck is find a place where you can serve, where you can do something for somebody else. You can get out of yourself and help others and help show that love of God to other people. When you serve, of course, you are helping to edify the body of believers and build up the faith and build up the church. The fourth area is to build ourselves up historically and culturally. As a local church, we have a history. We should know something about our history as a local church. How we got started, why we got started, who started us, uh, how that came about. What's our story? When a church has a comparatively strong sense of culture, it tends to be a little bit stronger. It's when a certain group, a certain culture, a certain church starts to forget their history and where they come from that things happen. Weird stuff can sometimes creep in. Now, I'll be one of the first to admit, sometimes there are things that culturally have been handed down in churches over the years that it's just, no, we, we don't need that. That's, that's fluff. But having a sense of history and culture tends to build unity in a congregation rather than disunity. It's not a matter of, well, why are we doing something a certain way? Oh, we've always done it that way. No, it's a matter of, why are we doing this this certain way? Here's the reasoning why we happen to do it that way. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't have to be done that way. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't have to be done that way, but here's why we do it. It gives us that sense of culture, that sense of unity together. We're walking together before the Lord. And I think it's important not just to be uh, involved in the, our history and in our culture as a local church, but also to figure out more, okay, denominationally, what's the history of the Southern Baptist movement? Warts and all, and boy, do we have some. What is the culture like in the Southern Baptist Convention? How does that work? What, is, what sets us apart from other Baptists? What sets us apart from the Lutherans? What sets us apart a little bit from the Methodists? It, it's, uh, I mean, would, would you have a good answer if somebody came to you and said, well, what is really different about you guys and the Lutherans? Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Had to throw those in there for fun. Um, what makes us different, but also what makes us united together? Build yourself up on the faith. Second, pray in the Holy Spirit. When we are facing an all-out battle, and unfortunately that often happens when a wolf or wolves come in the camp, we're going to need God's grace. We're going to need his mercy. We're going to need his wisdom. We're going to need his love going through us. We need to be people of prayer, corporately and individually. Without prayer, without the guidance and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be in trouble. Build yourself up on the faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. 
The text also says to keep yourself in the love of God. I thought that was kind of strange at first. I thought, did we really fall out of the love of God in any way? But then I was reminded of two things. One, I was reminded of the word abide. Mm -hmm. We often talk about how we need to abide in, in God's love. And I was reminded of, in the book of Revelation, a certain church called Ephesus. The problem with the church of Ephesus is that they, they were in a fight themselves. It looks like some wolves had, had tried to get in their church and they fought them off. And they fought them off doctrinally. And they said, no, you're not, you're not coming in here with that nonsense. And they smacked them down good. But somewhere along the line, Jesus did have one particular condemnation against the church. He said, you have forgotten your first love. When we're in the middle of a fight, when we're in the middle of a battle, it can become difficult to remember to love and to rest in God's love. If we do have false Christians ever come in this camp, I pray that never happens. But if we do, we are going to be tempted to hate the false Christians. And here's why. We are righteously going to be hating what they do, and we're going to be hating what they stand for. And we should. It's so easy to transfer hating what people stand for and what they do to then hating them personally. If wolves come into the camp, they could very well cause a great deal of hurt and a great deal of pain. And it's easy for us then to fall into hating them not just their actions and what it is that they believe. We are called, though, to love our enemies. When we abide in God's love, when we keep ourselves in the love of God, we realize that first he loved us, even though we were hostile to him. Even though we were his enemies, he first showed his love to us. When we reflect on that truth now, we can find the courage and the strength to love the false Christians in spite of themselves. And who knows where that may lead. If they are truly false Christians and they're on the road to eternal condemnation, it may have no effect on them whatsoever. It may drive them away. Or it may have no effect on them. But what about the non-believers, the unchristians who are sitting in amongst us and they're seeing how we are treating them in spite of what they're doing. What kind of testimony is it for them? What kind of testimony is it for the new believers, the baby Christians who are just sitting there? What's going on here? Oh my goodness, there's so much going on. And when they see that we are responding in love, firmness, firm love, but we're responding in love and truth to false Christians that are coming in, wreaking havoc, even if that means we lovingly have to drive them away. And yes, that can be very scriptural to do. But what kind of testimony is that to the new baby Christians among us when they see that we are treating scoundrels, wolves, with love? How do you do that? Well, let me show you how. <laughs> That is an opportunity for discipleship right there. That's an opportunity for growth in the church. We need to build ourselves up in the faith. We need to pray in the Holy Spirit. We need to keep ourselves in the love of God. And when it comes to taking care of ourselves, we need to wait anxiously for eternal life. Verse 21 says, uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. We have a different perspective on this. We're only here in this position for a little while, and then eternity is going to come upon us before we know it. Some of us probably sooner than later, but that's okay. Uh, here, here. Right. <laughs> but as it is, when I think of waiting anxiously for eternal life, the first thing popped into my head is, have you seen kids around Christmas time and Santa's coming? Santa! 
he's gonna come soon. He's gonna bring his presents and everything. And they're like hopping up and down with glee, and they're just waiting. Now, yeah, okay, it's true. I've I've already told my kids the truth about Santa. I blew that one for them. Um, no, actually, I wanted them to know about Jesus, the truth of Jesus. And I knew dishonesty was a bad policy, but nevertheless, that's not what I'm getting at now. Waiting anxiously for Santa. Yeah. Aren't, do we have that same sort of excitement when we think about Jesus coming back? Come quickly, Jesus. Any day now. Any day. Any day. Any day. Are we waiting like that? On a side note, anybody else looking forward to the first uh, December 25th rolling around when we actually get to celebrate it with Jesus? That's going to be great. That should be our attitude. We need to wait anxiously, not stressfully, that's not that kind of anxious, but waiting anxiously for Jesus to return, for eternal life to come. Because then we put all of this opposition in a whole different light. I suppose the snarky among us might look at that person and be like, in the end, you're going to lose. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not it. But more importantly than that, we know that in the end, we actually, we are the ones that do have the victory. That's our joy. We know we are going to win. Even if in the moment, we're fighting a hard battle. So if those are the four things that we can do for ourselves. Build, our, build, up our, uh, build ourselves up on our faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, keep ourselves in the love of God, and wait anxiously for eternal life. Now, others. These are others that are in the church. These are the others that I'm talking about, others that are among us. First, we need to make sure that we have mercy on the doubters. Verse 22 says, have mercy on some who are doubting. When false Christians come into the camp, they are coming in to try to divide. And in coming in to try to divide, there are going to be some people that are going to be like, I, I, I don't know what's going on. This person seems to have a lot of spiritual authority. They're spouting off verses. I, I have some trust with them. But something seems off, and I'm kind of going back, on, back and forth, back and forth. We need to have mercy on those that are doubting, to treat them with kindness, with gentleness, with respect, with truth. Second, we're called to snatch some out of the fire. Verse 23 says, save others, snatching them out of the fire. False Christians are dangerous, whether they're on the local level or whether they're on the global level, like on some of those people on TBN. False Christians are dangerous. And one thing that we are called to do, if we see somebody walking down that road, starting to follow somebody who is a false Christian or a false teacher, they're starting to go for the wolf, we're like, whoa, sheep, come on back. Come on back there. That's not where you want to go. Third, this is going to sound more like an environmental message. We need to have mercy on the doubters, snatch some out of the fire. The third way that we take care of others, that we regard others, is we watch out for pollution. No, I'm not going to put on a Captain Planet cartoon from the 80s right now. Um, we watch out for pollution. Verse 23 says, On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. The problem with, that can come with this kind of ministry is when you're working in the mud... It's very easy to get dirty. And we need to be very careful when we are being exposed to a lot of false teachings, when we are in the thick of the fight, we need to be careful that when we're reaching in to try to snatch others out of the fire, that we're not getting burned ourselves. That we're hating even the garment that's polluted by the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Be careful. Do this ministry by all means. But when you're doing this ministry, be careful yourself. Because it's easy to get wrapped up in these things or to have another temptation off, to the, off on the side, uh, to have something that maybe is pinpointed more at you something that comes in from left field, just be careful that you don't fall. I think that's one reason 
why in verse 24, as Jude is closing his letter, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, if we keep our strength in Jesus, in God, rather than relying on ourselves as we take on these responsibilities, then we are not going to have the same issues of being polluted by what it is that false Christians are doing. Now, to conclude, today is Communion Sunday. And it may seem like an odd passage to talk about the book of Jude and to talk about false Christians and the damage that they cause and then to go into Communion. But think about part of what communion represents. Communion is a time where we unite as a body, where we get together and we have union with Christ, but we also have union with one another. This is a time of unity. This is a time where we take in the body of Christ while acknowledging that we ourselves are the body of Christ. Being the body of Christ, we need to be in unity with one another. We need to follow those four, uh, the four things, the four precepts that Paul set down in Philippians. Having the same mind, the same love, being united in spirit, and being intent on one purpose. Those are things that false Christians set out to destroy, one at a time if need be. Communion is a time where we can actually celebrate these four things. When we can do something positive in order, in order to say, yes, we recognize the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and we recognize the union that we have with him and that we have with one another. I'd ask you to, this week, as you're going through your week, to think on these things. Not to be paranoid of false Christians. Far from it. But as our church starts growing, to keep in mind this message as a caution. To say, all right, there's a danger out there. It's a danger to our unity. It's a danger to our communion with one another. But now we're going to know how to deal with it.